Welcome to the Developing Your Football World podcast. Our guest is the amazing Gemma Hillier, the first female player inducted into the Portsmouth FC Hall of Fame, an England beach soccer star, and now currently working as a PE teacher in Dubai. Enjoy. Good morning, Gemma. Thanks for joining us. How are you doing today? Yeah, really good. Thank you. So tell us, where are you right now? Um, I am in my apartment in uh, Dubai. So I'm a teacher out in Dubai. So, uh, yeah, enjoying the sunshine out here. Brilliant. What part of Dubai are you in? Um, So I'm in Demak Hills um, and I work at Jebel Ali School. So we're not in the downtown area of Dubai. We're kind of uh, maybe like 10 kilometres inland a little bit. So not in the crazy part. Um, in the nice quiet part. <laughs> so it's not a bad place to be though, is it? So uh, no, it's pretty cool. <laughs> so we're going to go right back to the start and we're talking about your journey into football and then how you ended up as well, playing for Pompey for 17 years and then being the captain and being inducted into their Hall of Fame. So take us right back to the start, please. Yeah, so um, I was born into a really sporty family. Uh, My mum was a PE teacher. She was like an elite gymnast back in her day. Uh, My dad ran marathons. He was um, really good at squash, a great sailor. So, um, yeah, I was always given lots of opportunities growing up to play like lots of different sports, not just football. So um, I played um, squash, I did gymnastics, uh, crickets, um, yeah, loads and loads of sports. I was given so many opportunities. Um, and during year nine, I uh, represented six sports at county level. So after that year, I kind of had to choose which sport I wanted to go into as it was kind of like getting to the GCSEs. So, um, yeah, I guess that's how I got into sport. Um, both of my brothers are really sporty too. So, um, yeah, we're just a really sporty family, I think. So just really grateful that I was always given those opportunities. What were the other sports that you were competing at county level? Yeah, so I played football. Um, I was a gymnast, squash, basketball, um, cricket and uh, hockey. Do you think there was much uh, help or much overlap or transfer between those sports? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I'm quite an introverted person, so the uh, individual sports um, were kind of that side of me, I guess. And then uh, being part of a team kind of trans translates to loads of different sports. So, uh, yeah, I love being part of a team, meeting new people. So, yeah, loads and loads of different um, overlays. Obviously, loads of concepts of sports overlay as well. So, yeah. We'll come back to that in a bit when we dive more into the PE teaching. But... Uh... Tell us about your your time at Portsmouth. How did you first end up playing for Pompey? Yeah, great question. So um, I've supported Pompey uh, pretty much my whole life. Um, Had a season ticket since I was like six or seven years old. So um, at the time I was playing for uh, Fulham Centre of Excellence. So some of your older listeners... Uh, who might have followed women's football for a little bit longer, uh, might remember that Fulham and Charlton were kind of the two, back in the day, they were two of the the first teams to become professional. So um, I was really uh, lucky that I got to play for Fulham Centre of Excellence. Um, So at age 14, 13 and 14, I was there. Um, Again, just the travelling got too much. So um, I I then joined Pompey, but uh, Pompey only had a ladies team. Um, So they had a first team and a development team or reserves, as it was called back then. So uh, Vanessa Rainbird was the manager. um, And I was really, really lucky that I made my um, women's debut at age 14, which is quite scary to think now. But um, at the time, um, yeah, it was unreal. Uh, What changes have you seen over the years in women's football around here since when you first started compared to recently just before you left to go off to Dubai? Yeah I think the changes have been uh, phenomenal um, obviously back 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 when I first started playing there wasn't the funding 
um, women's football kind of wasn't recognised um, within the men's clubs. Um, and if it was, we were kind of given down like hand-me-down shirts. So they were all like extra large. Uh, we just looked ridiculous. But I'd say funding is probably the um, biggest thing that um, has changed. Um, obviously funding isn't everything, but funding really does change the way that you can kind of run a club, see development within the players, uh, the coaching staff. Um, and then obviously, ultimately, that leads to moving up the league. So, yeah, I'd say funding is probably the biggest change that I've seen. But um, also, like, people's general attitudes. Yeah. Um, when I was growing up playing football, um, it was kind of really unheard of and kind of not really the thing to do. Um, and even up to when I was inducted into the Hall of Fame, it still apparently wasn't the thing to do. So, um, I think now, especially the um, after the Euros, the Women's Euros, that's going to have a massive impact on like people's views of women's football uh, I think even in the short term what's it been like four or five weeks well, not even that long is it um, I've already seen like a massive change in um, maybe like attitude yeah are you still there I think I might have lost you yep still here Sorry, I thought it cut out then. So uh, I'll cut that bit out because it, it went a little bit funny, but I'll make it sound good. So one, of the big, yeah. so one of the big differences I've noticed recently uh, doing some summer camps and some other sessions there is you're now getting boys turning up wearing the Lionesses kit, which I don't think you would have done previously. And, and some of the other changes, which I think are more, more tangible, uh, would be... In 2015, I was travelling out during the Women's World Cup and it would be on in in bars and, and particularly in airports. I remember quite distinctly uh, waiting to get on a flight and seeing TV and people kind of looking at, oh, women, all right. Four years later, 2019, they're actually sat facing it and they're commenting on the game and they're talking tactically. So in those those four years, there was some some rapid acceleration in, in interest and I think acceptance as well like you mentioned with the, the funding even recently it took a lot of convincing for big professional teams to actually fully integrate their their women's teams and I think that's uh, it's we're at a stage where it's actually quite ridiculous now considering how late in the game things are yeah that's really true so um I didn't actually get to go to the final because I was in Birmingham with my mum watching the Commonwealth Games and um as you were talking about, like I've never seen women's football even on in a pub, whereas my mum and I went to this pub to watch the game um, because our hotel didn't have a TV. And I've never, it was just like you were watching the men's FA Cup final or yeah. the, the World Cup final. It was absolutely packed. People kind of really passionately cheering, like um, a bit of a stigma, but like seeing old men, like being really passionate, shouting and screaming was really kind of really uplifting. Um, so yeah, I totally agree. Um, yeah, how much it's come on. For those who haven't worked in women's football, what would you say would be some of the difficulties or, or struggles that might not be appreciated by those not involved? Um, I think it's stuff we've already touched upon, like not being appreciated by like your your men's team. Um, not that like they should have to pump loads of money in, um, but like kind of just like being appreciative that you're part of the club um i would say that would be the main thing um and again just the stigmas behind women's football but um hopefully these things are progressing and that people's attitudes are changing and that the the increase in girls playing football will continue to to rise and as you said like seeing boys wearing the lioness kit is it's just incredible it's it's yeah really breaking down the barriers Talking about your, your time at Pompey, what would you say were some of your most meaningful moments there? Yeah, there was quite a few. So obviously playing at Fratton Park was probably the best moment. Um, I'd obviously been going to the stadium, well, we'll call it a stadium, for, for many, many years. And um, getting to actually play there and like walk out the tunnel and uh, like hearing the music and the fans. Uh, that was probably the best feeling that I've ever experienced in football um, so yeah that was really really cool um, obviously being captain of the team as well was a really massive honour for me um, 
being captain of like a team that you've grown up supporting and then you finally got to play for um that was really really cool and um like getting to play with so many great players over the years and um, obviously I was there for like many many years so I've got to play with like players who have gone on to represent their countries and um had really successful careers so yeah that's probably the main thing and um, we reached the semi-final of the FA Cup which um was probably like the most prestigious kind of moment um but yeah just generally getting to play for Pompey the team I've supported all my life was um yeah really really cool now did you stay there for all that time because of your love and support for Pompey or uh, were you interested in the project did you want to see your local team do well yeah a bit of everything I guess um I was um, offered to go and play for other teams in higher leagues when like the WSL started, but um, I felt at Portsmouth we were always like developing. It was like a project um, and a, a developing project where we were always trying to get better. And um, we had a really, really great group of players um, at the time. So I just didn't want to leave because um, obviously the grass isn't always greener, but I loved it at Pompey and um yeah, I just wanted to take every opportunity and get to where I was being offered to play with Pompey. Unfortunately, that never worked out. But um, yeah, I think loyalty these days is not not as common. So that's something I'm really proud of for playing for the same team for so many years. Yeah, there's not a lot of that. I can only think of a handful of examples in, in the modern game. Uh, mm. that stayed at a club for even a decade, really. Yeah, yeah. So what was it that made you want to become a PE teacher? <laughs> so um, my, both of my parents are actually teachers. Um, my dad's a history teacher and my mum is a PE teacher. Um, so I think just growing up, being given all of those sporting opportunities, um, sport was the thing that kind of that I became passionate about. Um, when I was at college, I completed loads and loads of coaching courses. Um, I did a lot of volunteering, coaching, loads of different sports, uh, obviously mostly football. Um, so I think ultimately, like going to college and then university, um, I kind of, I, d I didn't really always want to be a PE teacher, but I kind of guessed that that would kind of probably be where I would lead because of my like qualities and what I was interested in. So kind of fell into it. But um, also, I think I was destined to be a teacher with both of my parents <laughs> being teachers. Yeah, it sounds like you were kind of made to be a PE teacher, particularly with your uh, experience in lots of different sports. And I, for myself, it's football and recently futsal as well. And a lot of people say that's the same sport, really. But uh, to have such a, a vast sporting background, that must have given you a huge leg up going in and lots of, lots of experience and ideas to draw upon to work with and inspire kids because... I know I can only really inspire kids to go into football. I don't know enough about the others to to generate enough interest. Yeah, definitely. The um, I guess that's your te a teacher's main role, isn't it, to inspire students? But um, yeah, teaching is a really competitive competitive industry, uh, especially PE teaching. Um, like, there's not many jobs out there. You've got to be different to other people. So. Um, yeah, as I said, my parents always encouraged me to try different sports, uh, coach different sports. That then led to obviously getting coaching awards in different sports. And I think that was the thing that probably kind of gave me something different to other people, that I had such a varied um, sporting background. Not Usually you get PE teachers who are kind of specialists in a sport, whereas I'm a bit of an all-rounder. So, yeah, it definitely gave me um, a big boost up to help me oh. get the jobs. I like to tackle some of the misconceptions and one that I hear frequently is that PE teaching is essentially a DOS. Like all the other teachers have got real jobs, whereas PE teaching is just you're putting on a pair of shorts and playing games with kids. So how true is that? Yeah, that is, I'm going to say it's completely untrue. Um, for me, it is the best job ever because um, you're getting to do what you love. Like sport is literally my life. I get to I say do that every day you're not actually joining in with the kids a lot of the time but it's what I'm passionate about so um <laughs> it, it's not an easy job like 
I've, we've done many like training courses in the past where classroom teachers come out and try and deliver a PE, PE lesson just to try and kind of go over those misconceptions and it's harder than people think so like teachers are able to control their kids in a small classroom like 30 kids whereas we've got to control them on like a massive field um so it's definitely not a DOS job um over here the hours are much longer as well so uh, well and back home you're doing fixtures kind of two or three nights a week out here it's more like four times a week so um where other teachers may be a marking in the evenings we're doing fixtures um obviously when you get to academic PE there's a lot of marking involved in that but essentially while other teachers are marking we're doing extracurricular clubs fixtures we're not getting home till like maybe 6 30 in the evening so um it's not a dead dosh job by any means but it is the best job in the world because that's what I'm passionate about what you just said about a lot of fixtures over then even that I wanted to talk more about Dubai later on but I just want to pull on this thread real quick so you're saying there's a lot more fixtures over there so can I understand that school sport might be more more prominent in Dubai compared to to back home or or is it more like uh, it's filling in a gap that isn't uh, provided by local clubs uh yeah really I think it's the, the out here sporting opportunities I found are really really just loads and loads of opportunities there's so many clubs for the for the kids to play playing like at home not many not as many students play sport outside of school they only play in school whereas here I'm finding a lot of there's a much higher percentage of students higher percentage sorry of students that love sport they'll play all the sports in the school and they'll play sport outside of school I think at home students tend to just play football or just play rugby or just do gymnastics out here they're a lot more open-minded and like they'll just play if you've got a sporty kid they will play every sport um so yeah I think school sport out here is a really really big part of kind of school life um yeah much bigger than it is at home like a lot more bigger deal is made of it interesting that sounds a bit more like in the US where kids would play two, three, four sports a year. So is that helpful? Is there a lot of conflict? Does it help their development to try and to participate in these different sports? Yeah, I guess it's good and bad because kind of your run of the mill student who's maybe like average in all sports, it's really great for them because they um, work on different skills um, like within the sport, they work on their like emotional sport. Um, qualities like teamwork things like that um and then so i've just had a massive mind blank what was the question again <laughs> so about the kids in in dubai that play a range of sport um, oh yeah that was it yeah, yeah. so um yeah you're run of the mill kids they um it, i think it's really really great for them for the more elite uh, sports people out here um it poses a bit of an issue because they just want to play every single sport whereas like at a time they need to concentrate on their one sport whereas uh, I think uh, out here overtraining is more of an issue than at home um, because there's just so many opportunities within school and outside of school so like obviously out here you want your best sports people representing the school um, at home I think there's a bit more kind of if you've got a student at like a professional football club they won't necessarily play for the school um, whereas out here it's kind of because um, all the schools are private obviously school sport and being in the top leagues is a really important for schools and parents so you're ultimately you want your best students playing so yeah I think overtraining over here for the students is an issue uh, but um, ultimately it helps school sport improve so um, there's positives and negatives for all aspects. It does sound to me like it poses a dilemma similar to in the US where the kids might play multiple sports, but the pressures on them are such that each coach or each sport demands 100% commitment. And it's like the kids are burning the candle at both ends and being stretched way too thin because they've got to commit fully to baseball, which means three, four days a week of baseball and three, four days a week of basketball, three, four days a week of football, and they can't give their best for everything. So what you find is there's not much of a gap 
for kids who just want to play once or twice a week casually with their friends. It has to be a hundred percent effort and commitment all the time, or nothing. You know, uh, so is, is there a similar problem in Dubai? Is there much options for uh, casual? Uh, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say so. I think the clubs that I've uh, I've only been involved in football clubs outside of school over here, but um, definitely within that club, they are very kind of um, accommodating towards the students that play other sports as well. So um, I'm involved in a football club called uh, Empire and um, they've got thousands of kids, boys, girls of all ages, right from four right up to um, under 18s. And um, they're a really great club. Um, I've been involved obviously with the girls set up and a lot of those are really high level netballers and they're also really great footballers and the girls want to play both sports. Um, so therefore, if Empire are not accommodating towards them, they just won't play. So, um, yeah, they're invited to different sessions. They're given different option days to train. Um, if they can't train, they just play in the matches. Um, so, yeah, my experience is that clubs are really accommodating out here, which is obviously great for the students and great for sport in the UAE. Yeah. Much better. I, I like that approach because ultimately it's the game is for the kids, isn't it? And, and we can't be gatekeepers. Like I know a lot of coaches yeah, like to. Yeah. yeah we'll, we'll come back to Dubai because there's a lot of good things I want to ask. And it's one of the most popular destinations for for coaches that want to go work abroad. And I've frequently been asked about about Dubai, so we will get into that in more detail. Right now, I'd like to move on to beach soccer. So I've come to watch a, a training session. Obviously, because we uh, support Molly Clark as well, watching a lot of the goals, a lot of the highlights. And what impressed me most is just the sheer acrobatics of it, which you might not associate with with football. But uh, seeing some of the, the goals, yeah, that's incredible. I mean, I, I pull and twist and break several limbs if I was <laughs> to play even 10 minutes of it. So let's talk first. How did you get into beach soccer? Uh, yeah, yeah. Another great question. Just going back to Molly quickly and just saying that it's just on the beach. Um, we pl I played for Bournemouth with Molly before I came out to Dubai and quite regularly in training, we'd uh, try uh, different acrobatic bicycle kicks, um, her more than anybody else. So, yeah, it's not, not just on the sand. But, um, yeah, beach soccer, uh, how did I get into it? Um, when I was playing for Portsmouth on the grass, um, our manager at the time, I think it was back in 2012, was Perry Northeast. Um, another great coach that I've had the opportunity to work with. Um, he um, played for the England men's beach soccer team at the time. Um, they were really successful, but at the time there was no women's team. Um, and at Portsmouth, um, this is the season where we won the National League, uh, sorry, the Southern League, and um, we played in a playoff to get promoted to the uh, WSL. Uh, unfortunately, we lost that game. Um, so we didn't get promoted. And I guess Perry saw like a niche that there was no women's team at the time. We had a really talented Portsmouth team um, with lots of technical players. We had really fit players. Um, but what we all loved was playing at a high level football. So um, he started um, England women's beach soccer team. And it's kind of just gone from there, really. So a few of us from the team um, that started then um, kind of like kicked off the team and then it's developed from there. Have you found yourself and the other players as well uh, playing football one grass and scoring some absolute weldies because you've developed that in beach soccer? Yeah, absolutely. So um, beach soccer is obviously a really technical sport, keeping the ball in the air um, and it transfers over to, to grass. Um, Molly, especially, I'll say she's scored some absolutely brilliant goals on grass that you would think she was on sand, but definitely gives you the confidence to try more acrobatic things on the grass. Does it hurt your feet? <laughs> Great question. So, um, didn't the ball is a normal football? It's just slightly softer. I mean, it's nothing like like when we were kids kicking around a plastic ball, thinking you were Roberto Carlos, but it is a bit of a softer ball, um, only slightly. Um, so if you're like, if the first few training sessions back um, in pre-season for beach soccer, your feet do hurt a little bit because of the constant kind of kicking of the ball, but I guess your feet just get used to it and 
and then yeah you don't really think about it it doesn't hurt um but it can be painful on uh, Bournemouth beach when there's a few shells shells mm-hmm. in the sand <laughs> what are some of the most fun things about playing beach soccer Oh, there's loads of great things about beach soccer that makes it really fun. Um, obviously, the bicycle kicks and the acrobatics uh, make it fun to watch. But um, playing beach soccer, there's always music on. It's a bit more of a party atmosphere. So there's music on while you're playing in the matches. Um, if there's like a penalty or a free kick, there's like the, uh, you know, like the boom, boom, sh- boom, boom, sh- while you're running up to take the free kick. So that gives it an element, a little bit more of an element of excitement and um yeah, just getting to travel around and experience different cultures and countries just just makes it really, really fun. Mm. Yeah, speaking of music, we, I try and use a lot of music in, in, in futsal and they don't appreciate my choices, but uh, I'm convinced that Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath does improve futsal performance. And if ever I do a PhD, that will be my hypothesis to try and prove that I need to listen to <laughs> The heavy metal and rock, I guarantee that will that'll get you a couple of extra goals a game. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure we have any of that in beach soccer, but <laughs> I'd, like, I'd like to see your results. <laughs> give, me, give me a year. Uh, we'll, we'll see how this year goes. Uh, there's a lot of optimism, and I, I will I'll probably upgrade my speaker to a massive guitar amp and see if that does it and blast it so loud they can't hear me coach. And that might actually be the deciding factor. The less input you hear for me, <laughs> The better because uh, ability equals potential minus interference. Perhaps I'm interfering and the music is blocking more. Get some beach soccer music on instead, that will help. <laughs> What's on a beach soccer playlist? Uh, it's more like reggaeton and like dancey type music. Um, I but can't stand when you're reggaeton. playing, it, it's really great because at the end of the game, um, like say people have come to watch or a player might say like oh like did you hear that that song came on like none of us have a clue what music's on during the during the game whereas when you're sat in the stands watching a game like you you hear all the music and you're like oh if this came on when we were playing that'd be great and then someone else would be like it did so yeah you literally don't hear the music while you're playing but it is great what have been well sorry i just asked that question how difficult is it to represent England? Yeah, it's a different level to obviously playing like grassroots football. Um, I've never been a professional playing grass football. So, um, yeah, representing your country, obviously, you're always going to be really proud to represent them. Um, I think the level of prof- professionalism that you have to show is um, a lot harder for different people. Um so people maybe that haven't played a high level football maybe maybe struggle a little bit more to adapt to the professionalism that's needed but um yeah it, ultimately it's hard to play for your country or you're representing the whole country and different things you've had to go through to be selected um yeah it's always going to make it hard but ultimately yeah it's a re- really proud moment and yeah we all all of us that play for england absolutely love it the opportunity for England have taken you lots of different places around the world. So where have you gone? What what uh, locations has beach soccer led you to? Yeah, it's traveling the world has probably been my best, like if people say like, what's your best part of beach soccer? Getting to travel the world is um, been the best part. So um, obviously we've managed to travel different places, loads of different places in Europe playing for England. Um and when we've played well for England, um, beach soccer in countries works a diff- little bit differently. So um, obviously grass football, you have leagues throughout a whole season. With beach soccer in different countries, they tend to have national championships, which are maybe held over four or five days. So you're not kind of tied down to playing for one team. Um, so when you play well for your country, you then get scouted and get offered to play in different countries. So um, I've been really, really lucky over the years. Um, I've um, played in Switzerland, Italy, Poland, um, just just so many different countries. And probably Trinidad and Tobago um, was a really cool place uh, to go. So when after we won the Euros in 2018, um, an American team called Shoreline. Um, they got in contact with a couple of us and said, did we want to play? Um, obviously, we said yes. Um, 
and it turned out yeah the tournament was in Tobago so um that was just incredible just seeing a country like that and because we won the tournament um we got to go on a like a boat trip and uh, we got to go like miles and miles out to the ocean and the guy was like oh get off the boat um and the water was literally up to our waists and you could see your feet it was just yeah absolutely incredible but um yeah getting to travel around the world meeting new people like beach soccer is a really social sport um it's really like friendly it's not like in football necessarily where like you hate everyone <laughs> in beach football like everybody's like really friendly with each other obviously on the pitch you're not but off the pitch um yeah it's a really social sport uh, getting to see lots of different cultures is it's yeah it's really it really is incredible so i advise like people should get involved with it because it's definitely changed my life it does give the perception of being a very uh, close community with, with a lot of togetherness and probably because you get to play so many different places I mean, who wouldn't be happy doing all that uh, your passport must be getting quite worn out as well <laughs> yeah that's one of the benefits just yeah it, it really is a really social sport and it's a really close-knit sport so playing for England we're not just a team like we generally are like a group of friends as well which obviously really really helps yeah, that comes across quite strong on, on social media. The pictures you're putting up looks like everyone's just having the best time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, obviously, when we're at training, we're not always good friends because people make mistakes and don't do the jobs they should do. But uh, I think we're really good at, like, when we finish training and get off the pitch, like, we're a group of friends again. On the pitch, we want to be the best in the world. So if that means you have to shout at someone, then, like, that that's just it's international sport that's what happens um but yeah we are yeah we are a really close-knit group well speaking of best in the world england have done quite well in the last couple of years uh, and molly was voted world's best player as well so what success for those who haven't been paying attention or who this might be their first introduction to beach soccer how well has england done over the last couple of years and what's on the horizon yeah, it's really, really interesting because um, we are part, we're under the FA's umbrella, but we're a self-funded sport. So since 2012, um, we've never received any money to help help go towards training, tours, uh, things like that. So everything, all the tours that we go on are self-funded. Uh, we rely on like local businesses, national businesses and companies to help fund us as a team, individually, as you know. Um, so obviously in England as well, we haven't always got the best weather. Um, we haven't got many sandy beaches. So um, beach soccer for an England team is really, really difficult. So um, we, a lot of us train in Portsmouth just on a sand volleyball court. And leading up to 2018, when we won the first European Cup, um, that's all we had trained on. So um Coming from kind of that kind of background, I think we've always appreciated um, the hardship that we've been through. Therefore, when we get to tournaments, we know how hard we've worked to get there. So um, there's a lot of teams now and countries that get paid to play beach soccer. And um, maybe their passion isn't as strong as us because we know where we've come from. We've known, as I've said, the hardship that we've been through. So, um, yeah, that's kind of where we came from. We're still in the same like financial position now where we're trying to get sponsorship um but yeah um we all train so so hard and after the 2018 euros sarah kempson was world's best player and then since molly clark's obviously been nominated twice and she's won the she's the this year she is the world's best player so um she is head and foot above anybody else in the world um and that is due to her dedication uh, on the sand. And so what are the upcoming tournaments if people want to to be aware and to tune in? Yeah, so um, this year and next year are two massive years in the world of beach soccer. Um, in 2019, we went to the World Beach Games, which is an Olympic event. Uh, we went to Qatar and we got a silver medal. Um, and for all of us, that was literally the best we've represented Team GB. It was the best experience kind of 
I'll say ever, it was just so, so surreal how professional we got treated. So uh, next week, we're actually in Italy for the 2023 World Beach Game qualifiers. Um, and that's in Bali next August. Um, so yeah, next week, um, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, um, we have uh, three games to try and get four games, sorry, to try and get to that. Um, and then the week after is the second phase of the European Cup. So in the first phase, um, it was three games and we ended up one point off the top. So uh, we've got two games to go. Um, and then the top four teams qualify for the super finals. And then obviously that goes to semi-finals and finals um, where we're hoping obviously to be European champions. So um, if we manage to do that, um, that qualifies us as well for the European Games next year, uh, which are being hosted in Poland. So uh, again, that's another Olympic event. Um, the bonus for us is if we get into these events, they're funded, which obviously, as I've been speaking about for us, that is really, really massive. Um, so yeah, it's a really, the next two weeks are really important for us um, to help push on and move beach soccer in England. Honestly, I can't decide if I'm more jealous of the travel or the football opportunities. This is, <laughs> this is. It sounds like a, an absolute dream come true, and you must be enjoying it so much. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, people do say you create your own luck, but um, there is an element of luck. Like you got to be spotted by the right people. You got to know the right people. But yeah, beach soccer has given all of us so many opportunities, and as you say, it's like a dream come true, getting to travel the world, playing a sport that you absolutely love. Like, who wouldn't want to do that? Now, let's go back to where you currently are. And we'll talk about what first appealed to you about moving to Dubai. Why did you want to go there? Sounds like a stupid question, actually, but go on. <laughs> no, so I'd never been on holiday to the Middle East or anywhere like this. But um, as I said, when we went to Qatar in the World Beach Games, obviously that's quite close to uh, the UAE, um, and we had a lot of British fans come and watch us. And mm. um, after one of the games, I got talking to a lady who was a teacher in Qatar, and um, she just said, she was like, oh, you've got to go and teach, come and teach out here. Um, not necessarily Qatar, but she was like, oh, start in Dubai um, or anywhere in the UAE. And like she was like you'll just love it so that's kind of where my spark came from um obviously while we were in Qatar we didn't get to see much of the country um because we were either in our hotel or playing beach soccer um and that kind of ignited something in my brain I I'd always wanted to work abroad because I love the sun but I would never really kind of looked into it so um that kind of made my mind up that um Dubai um was the place to come to and you're back out there for a second year, so I'm guessing you still feel that way. Yeah, so last year I absolutely loved it. Um, what's, not lo what's not to love? Um, the sunshine is obviously a massive benefit. Um, I'm a little bit biased, but I work for Jebel Ali School, which is one of the best schools uh, in the UAE. Um, the students are just so polite, like it's so different to back home. Um, all the staff are so friendly. Um, I guess everybody, all the staff are in the same boat, like majority of people have moved away from like their home country. So everybody appreciates like what different stages you're at. Um, I, yeah, I absolutely loved it last year. Um, so yeah, I've come back for a second year. Apart from maybe the 40 degree heat, has there been anything that it's been difficult to adjust to? It's actually closer to 50 at the moment, but um, yeah. <laughs> um, Difficult to adjust to, yeah. Um, so I'm quite a, this is a really pedantic thing, but I'm quite a fussy eater. Um, so yeah, that's been quite hard out here. Because obviously, like, you want to try and be really social to make lots of new friends. Mm. Um, and yeah, so yeah, the food's quite hard out here. Um, the price of things is really expensive out here. Obviously, everything's imported. Um, so it's a really um, expensive way to live. But um, I guess, well people might not know but you have a tax-free salary out here so your salary kind of reflects how expensive it is to live but um I'd say it's quite an easy place to um fit into because such a high percentage of the country are expats so like it's such a safe country like I've never ever felt 
like scared or like unsafe um and everywhere you go just everybody's so happy uh, i wanted to ask you this one earlier but I, it's pretty appropriate here so back in england when you're playing for pompey and then you're teaching kids in school did that ever come up and ever impress them like now in, in dubai oh, misplaced it for england does that ever come up do you uh, do you ever kind of use that against the kids if they if they act up or try and question you? <laughs> That's a good question. No, um, I'm not very good at like bragging about all the things that I've achieved. So even when I got inducted into the Hall of Fame at Pompey, like that's a really massive deal. It took my school quite a few weeks to find out about it. And um, I was really lucky in England, my school, like, they were so so supportive of everything I did sporting wise that it was always on social media um like they really projected it which was great and uh, my school out here have been um really similar like that all the staff and the students are really supportive um like so many of the parents out here like write really lovely messages and things but you don't really get well I, we don't have many sh naughty students at Jebel Ali school so I've never had to use it uh, against anybody but um it's quite cool like I teach academic PE and some of the students in their sporting examples actually write about me and that's kind of really surreal like when you read their answers and like you're their example um it's quite cool but as I said like really surreal I found uh, a lot of humility in in players particularly uh, in in women's sport because I think of how much you got to kind of fight against to to make it it's, it's rare to come across someone that's big-headed, even when they probably could and should be based on all that they've achieved. And I'm finding a lot of uh, a lot of players, like what you said, your school taking weeks to find out. They have no idea what, the, what these people are up to in their, in their spare time, the great achievements that they have playing in front of loads of people. Uh, and that is a completely different field of mental because uh, I, I see any bloke who does anything good, suddenly they never shut up about it. And I, I know I would, if I scored just one goal, like what I've seen you, know, you lot do in beat soccer, it would be all over Facebook, Twitter, Instagram for the rest of my <laughs> life. And I would dine out on that forever. When I actually uh, scored a goal last year, it wasn't a real goal. The ball came over to me on the sideline and I just passed it back to the keeper and she dropped it and it went in the goal. And I, I did shut up about that one, and <laughs> just because I'd scored on on that platform, and I think you you you're not yeah. doing this for real. And uh, humility is it's an underappreciated attribute to have in sport, and it's it's fantastic that you are. But I, I want to give you a lot of praise right now because I'm so fascinated by your journey and everything you've achieved, and just enjoying living vicariously through you. Yeah, as um as in England, as a team like England Beach Soccer, the women's team, we're all very similar, and um it's definitely one of our massive downfalls is that we don't put enough like out there of ourselves and like what we have achieved and stuff, um which is obviously why we find it really difficult to get sponsorship and stuff because we don't brag about what we do. Um, everybody always says that we have to do that, but it's kind of not the people that we are, so it's really difficult for us. So, um, obviously, people like you trying to help. Uh, promote us is um, kind of what we rely on but yeah we should definitely uh, boast more about what we've achieved but <laughs> so I'm trying to do it on, on behalf of them so I think you might have played with uh, a few of our football players for a while with Becca Tonks being one of them and she mm. she struggles with with praise you say good game <laughs> sounds all embarrassed <laughs> and shy so the fact yeah. that she's banging in goals on television and a lot of her friends and colleagues don't even know she's doing it, it it's it's quite a, a weird situation to be in I think because again I, I would be constantly bringing it up so I, I, I do my best to be the hype man where I can yeah yeah it's great thank you well uh it's now just sorry I'm adjusting myself in my chair I hope that's not coming across too much Let's just talk a few uh, a few more questions about Dubai then. Yeah, of course. The end of the time there. <clears throat> uh, I don't think which one I'm asked. Let's go for the schools. My uh, brief experience over there is that a lot of the schools, well, the private schools, and they have some fantastic facilities. Is that true? And does that help you in the job in any way? 
yeah absolutely that's probably the uh the wow factor that kind of when I got here and understanding and seeing all the different private schools and uh, so out here you don't have they're all private schools so every child pays to go to school uh, it's not like back home apart from like the um like the ministry schools so um yeah the facilities are just incredible like every school without fail has like a massive astro pitch or like perfectly pristine grass pitches um most schools have swimming pools uh, my school's got a massive well two swimming pools um undercover um again my school we're really lucky we've got a double sports hall upstairs and a single sports hall downstairs whereas in england like you would never ever see that and there's many schools in dubai that have got even better facilities than jebel ali i know there's a school called desk where a lot of premier league clubs actually come out to train on their pitch and like could you imagine in england like some of the school pitches that you see um you just don't get that out here i've not been to any school where you look at the facilities and think, oh, they're a bit naff. Um, yeah, all the facilities are just, yeah, in incredible. So it's it's a really high priority out here, sport. And um, the government, one of their main, that two of their main objectives are education and health. So if you put the work in, in the schools at that age, then it produces kind of healthy adults, I guess. So yeah, facilities are absolutely unreal. Why do you think it is that they're so keen on on sport as a as an emirate? Why why does the government want to pump so much money into that? Um, I'm not really too sure, but I know that they're like main one of their main objectives from different like tourist things that I've done is education, and I guess from that, um, having a healthy nation when they're older is means that people are going to live longer. So I I guess from that, but I'm unsure as to why like sport is like a main objective for them specifically it's interesting that you're linking sport and education because i think in england we don't tend to do that a lot of schools that i've worked in are still there's a i think prejudice might be the wrong word but there's still a, a stigma towards sport being it's more like a reward something that kids do at the end of the day to try and relax and unwind where when it should and could quite easily be an educational vehicle to teach you, you just look at uh, football just go to one game and you see everything that happens in life happens there sociology I know my geography knowledge is fantastic simply because of world cups and, and even FA cups and things like that and it, it's great to hear that you that talking about over there they mention or they link their education and and sport together so so heavily that's uh, brilliant yeah, absolutely. I think at home, it's kind of PE or sport is either, as you said, a reward or for some kids, a punishment out right. here, right from kind of FS, which is like before reception, they do PE, they do, it's not called PE, it's called like movement and, and stuff, um, right. but like do PE and it's like an expectation, the students just do it. And I feel in England, like there's more options to not do PE, whereas here, yeah. Like when they get to secondary school here, because they've done like PE is an expectation they join in on. Even the students who like hate sport and have no interest in sport, they'll give it their all in the lesson. At the end of the lesson, they'll thank you for the lesson. Like that would never happen in England because they see it as a punishment. Whereas out here, they might not enjoy what they're doing necessarily, but they understand that they have to do it because their education is telling them that it leads to a healthy and fit, a healthy lifestyle when they're older. So it's definitely a massive um, culture change and shifting kind of mindset out here, which um, I, I've really enjoyed, enjoyed that. Well, you're definitely selling it to me. Everything sounds uh, brilliant. <laughs> uh, so you played for Pompey for what, 17 years? And then you went to yeah. Bournemouth for a little while. And now yeah. where are you playing? Yep, so now I play for a team in Dubai called Onyx FC. So um, Onyx, up until last season, was just a group of girls who kind of entered different leagues, um, a group of friends. Um, last season, they made it more of a kind of like a business and had a strategy. So uh, Onyx is the only um, club in the whole of the UAE that's female-owned. It's got female coaches and it's for females. Um, 
it's a really, really great club. Obviously, it started as a group of friends. Um, I was really fortunate that I joined Onyx right at the start when there was only kind of like 10 of us at training. And um, th there's four of the women that own the club. And what they've done over the last year is just fantastic. And like we now enter, so we enter the professional 11 aside league, uh, which we came um, second in last year. Um, we enter kind of like it's called the AWFL league. So it's kind of seven aside or nine aside league. Um, again, that's quite like a good standard. And then there's also out here you have social leagues and um, the girls have kind of like 40 or 50 females turning up to this social training each week. Um, and it's women who have never played football before, right up to women who have played like a really high level football. So um, there's women from all different cultures. Um, there's Emirati women that go, which is just incredible. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I'm really lucky that I play for a club who um, kind of have women at the forefront of, of, of their strategy, I guess. So do you see football becoming more prominent? Do you think in, in the UAE that football's on a, on a good trajectory? Yeah, absolutely. So obviously the, Dubai is only 50 years old So as a country. So... It, it, women's football out here is still really, really new. But even in the short time, the year that I've been here, like there's so many more clubs that have kind of come to a light. So many more women want to play. Um, that just goes to show having like these 40 to 50 social players turning up to training. That's just like just 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 incredible. So um, there's more and more leagues being started. Um, last year was the first 11 aside league and um there was a big disparity in like levels from the bottom to the top, but the top kind of maybe four or five teams um, ability was really, really strong. So I can definitely see it progressing. Like they've got a national team, they've got age groups. Um, so yeah, it's definitely on the right traje trajectory. And that, 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 that's absolutely brilliant. It sounds like Dubai has got, or UAE in general, has a lot of the right ingredients mm -hmm. to eventually become a, a sporting power in its own right with us you know, in the Gulf region or whether that is you know, Asia or even globally. It sounds like there's a lot of really, really good things going on that's going to pay off in yeah, the future. absolutely. And as we've spoken about, they've got the facilities as well, haven't they? They've got the money to fund those. So, yeah, as, as the country develops, obviously they've only got a small amount of people that live in the UAE, so it's always going to be difficult, but um, mm -hmm. they are progressing. Yeah, and size doesn't always have to be a barrier. You look at places like Uruguay, Croatia, Belgium, yeah, and they've done true. fantastic. And you think with a, a healthy, sport-interested nation like that, uh, it'd be really interesting to see what it's like in, in 30 years' time, where the yeah, yeah. UAE might become a more uh, common country at World Cups. It'd be very interesting mm. to watch that. Well, thank you very, very much for your time today. That's, that's been brilliant. Really appreciate it. Uh, brilliant answers. And uh, if people want to know more about beach soccer, following the team, uh, and even just watching some of the games to understand what it is, uh, where can they go to do that? Yep. So on um, social media, um, on Instagram, there's two accounts to follow. Well, a few accounts to follow. So there's the Lionesses Beach Soccer account. There's the England Beach Soccer account, and then the main um, like body for beach soccer across the world is called Beach Soccer Worldwide. So um, they always post lots and lots of content. Um, our games next week are actually on an app called Recast, and that's all on. It's all free to watch. Um, you just kind of like got to watch <laughs> adverts to gain credits. Um, so all the information for that is on our um, social media handles. Um, so, yeah, definitely um, yeah, look into it. And any females or males that have played football in the past and want to try something different, um, I definitely promote Beach Shocker to give it a try. Well, best of luck. I know you're going to do fantastic. Enjoy yourself and, and thank you for coming on. Cheers. Thanks very much. Thanks to Gemma for coming on. Uh, give England Beach Soccer a follow on socials to give the team your support. We hope you're enjoying the new BFCN Shorts feature, a short form series of interviews to help you learn about different locations all over the world. If you want to coach abroad, 
We've had recent listings on a jobs board in Mexico, USA, Spain, Italy, Morocco, uh, British Virgin Islands, UAE, Bahrain, Oman and Australia. We'll see you next time.